You're listening to Past Imperfect. Please be advised that in this episode, there are discussions of topics that some listeners may find upsetting. Hello and welcome to Past Imperfect, in association with Speakers for Schools, a youth social mobility charity. I'm Alice Thompson. And I'm Rachel Sylvester, and we're talking to extraordinary people who've overcome trauma or adversity to achieve great success. Our guest today was born in 1932 and brought up in Hogan Ball, a beautiful Palladian house in North Norfolk, surrounded by 25,000 acres, the eldest of three daughters of the Earl and Countess of Leicester. The royal family are all over the news after the publication of Prince Harry's memoir and the row over Lady Susan Hussey's comments about race, but our guest experience of the palace predates all that. Her neighbours were Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, and she was maid of honour at the late Queen's coronation. Her father was an equerry to George VI, her mother a lady-in-waiting to the Queen. Her childhood sounds idyllic, playing on sandy beaches, but her sadistic nanny tied her up to the bed every night. And she married a man who took her to a brothel on her honeymoon to teach her about the facts of life. She parted with Mick Jagger and David Barry on her husband's island of Mystique. Colin Tennant could be violent and cruel as well as charming, saying, I'm going to break you, Anne. But she was stoic, even when her two eldest children died far too young, one a heroin addict and one of AIDS-related diseases. A third son sustained life-changing injuries in a car crash. Then, at the age of 87, she wrote her memoirs, Lady in Waiting. The aristocrat told the publishers she hoped to sell half a million copies and go on the Graham Norton show. They politely demurred, but she did both. She's now written a second, Whatever Next, Lessons from an Unexpected Life, where she got thousands of letters asking for advice from bereaved parents, gay men and abused wives. Lady Glenn Connor, thank you so much for joining us on Past Imperfect. So what's it like to be an agony aunt and a gay icon? Well, I'm absolutely thrilled. (laughs) I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would, uh, you know, achieve this. Um, I'm so touched, too, uh, by all the letters I get from all over the world. Uh, The other day, I was doing something for the Prince's Trust, and they said, um, would you like to know who sponsored you? So I said, yes, I would. Oh, they said, it's the gay community in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hardly, I didn't, I had to look at the map to see where Milwaukee was. <laughs> and one meeting you in your flat in Holland Park, and it's surrounded by photographs of all your children and grandchildren and husband. Is this your sanctuary? It is. I don't have a mobile, and the only way you can get in touch with me is by postcards or landline. You have Alexa, don't you? Yeah. Well, yes. My 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 um, uh, son-in-law gave me this funny little box one Christmas, and I said, "What on earth is this?" Oh, he said, "It's Alexa, and if you ask her to play music or whatever, she will." And I simply couldn't get over it. I was thrilled, and of course, I treated her very, very politely at the beginning. I think <laughs> came up really near. Her her and said, it would be frightfully kind, would you be able to play um, La Boheme? Um, and off she went. Now I realise all I have to do is sit at my kitchen table and shout, play this or play that. <laughs> and she does. And did people ask you for selfies? Yes, quite a lot. Um, when I, um, I, I, What I love doing, which I think was rather surprising to my publishers, is that I've always, right from early age of 16, I've been a travelling salesman. And so I love selling my books. Um, and I, I loved uh, talking, uh, all these talks, and all the uh, uh, lovely people who come to listen to me come and have a chat afterwards. Um, and, you know, I, I, I get quite involved in their lives, actually. And you lived in some ways an incredibly privileged life, but it's also been immensely tough, which I think is why people feel so warmly towards you. Can we take you back to that childhood? Can you just talk a bit about what it was like before the war? Well, before the war was wonderful because um, my father was in the Scots Guards and uh, so he did move around a bit. Uh, My mother was absolutely wonderful. I adored my mother. Uh, She was fun. She was brave. She was exciting, you know. She rode a Harley Davidson in black leathers, which was quite unusual in those days. And uh, she always was uh, uh, climbing trees with us. Um, We were uh, camping on the beach. We just had great fun. My father wasn't such fun. He was (laughs) a bit more um, uh, pernickety, really. Uh, Absolutely insisted on us having our windows wide open 
open all night. Uh, and it's jolly cold. <laughs> it was banged by the North Sea. And actually, Carrie and I shut the windows the minute he'd left the room. Uh, and uh, they really always ask us if we'd be gone to the lavatory properly for some reason. And do you think your family would be disappointed you weren't a boy? Yes, there's a picture of uh, me, my first picture I was christened at Holcombe. And uh, my father is carrying me, he's standing on the steps of the marble hall at Holcombe. My grandfather's one side and my great grandfather the other. And they're looking so depressed, uh, gazing at me. How could she possibly be a girl? You know? um, and, and the eldest. Uh, and there's no, uh, there's no sign of my mother. I mean, women were completely wiped out. I mean, in that sort of, sort of uh, aristocratic sort of, the men were everything. Right. Um, and what I, virtues I, were you supposed to have as an aristocratic girl? Did they tell you how to behave? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. What virtues were you supposed to have as an aristocratic girl? Did they tell you how to behave? Yeah, well, very much so. I mean, we, we were told that men uh, were the most important, you know. And, of course, I didn't have a brother. I had two sisters. And uh, when my, my, my mother had me, she was told, better luck next time, and then better luck next time, and finally she gave up. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, Holcomb was uh, completely based uh, on, on men, uh, in a way, from the outside, Holcomb looks very masculine. And it was all sort of shooting, and we had the best uh, partridge shoot, you know, in Great Britain. And um, they shot and they fished. And, um, and then my mother, quite often, used to arrange for these shooting parties. They were all male. Uh, and do the dinner, wonderful uh, uh, dinners they used to have. And then she went back to her sitting room to have something on a tray. <laughs> I mean, she didn't take part. Actually, she didn't mind too much, especially when the television came, uh, when we had this sort of weenie box in the corner, like a postage stamp. And, of course, when we were growing up, we, we joined her in the sitting room. So what were your memories of being a girl? What did you do? What were you allowed to do as girls? Uh, sounding was only 10 miles away. And uh, I three... Um, Princess Mark, the first time I saw her, she was five, I think, or just five, um, I knew she, I hoped she was going to be my friend because she was, I could see she was quite naughty and fun. And, of course, we had absolutely had the best time. The Queen was always looking out for her, you know, um, and uh, it was more, more serious. I mean, she was older. Uh, I remember uh, we went, Princess Margaret and I were on our tricycles whirling around the Marble Hall, and which we weren't meant to do, <laughs> and down the steps at, at Holcomb and the Queen, and I think one of our cousins came, and I remember she said, Margaret, Anne, what are you doing? Very, very naughty of you. And I remember Princess Margaret and I screaming with laughter, sort of peddling <laughs> off down the road. But, but then, then we, used to, we, we used to swim together on the beach in, in the summer, and we, we, I remember digging holes, hoping people might fall in there. I don't think <laughs> people did, actually. But, but I, Princess Margaret and I, and then, of course, the war came. Uh, and we, I, I didn't see them until I was, you know, much older. But anyway, we had this sort of idyllic childhood until the war. And then uh, my father was in the Scots Guards. He was posted to Egypt. And he actually fought uh, uh, during uh, Al Alamein. And um, my mother, because that's what wives did. I mean, husbands came first, children came second, very much. Uh, and so I always remember going to see my mother for the last time, just before the war. And she said, I'm going out to join Daddy, but I'll be back fairly soon. And then she looked at me, and I was just seven, and she said, Anne, I want... You're in charge. You've got to look after Carrie and see she's OK. So I took my... Um, and she was how old, Carrie? Uh, my, my sister was five. OK. And uh, at the same time, I can't quite remember my mother introducing me, but suddenly Miss Bonner appeared. And um, my mother had said, I've, we've engaged a governess for you. And I don't think that they really knew anything about her. I mean, they can't have really. I... I, I because I never found out, because once, long afterwards, when uh, I was grown up, I felt sort of brave enough, the, the moment came, that, and I said to my mother, did you realise what Miss Bonner did to me mm -hmm. in the war? And she just said, oh, darling, things happened in the war. And, that and what was that. did happen to you? In them? Because she well, sounds very um, sadistic. She um, was rather pretty, Miss Bonner, 
Um, and that was confusing too, because you think if somebody's pretty, they're going to be kind. I don't know why you do. You, you, at least uh, as a child, you think somebody really wicked and cruel looks like as a witch, you know. And she didn't. She looked really pretty. And I remember Uncle, great Uncle Joe, uh, uh, obviously you know, thought she's wonderful. I remember, because mm. he's always dressed in a kilt, and I remember her marring his kilt and all that sort And of you thing. were in Scotland then, weren't yes, you? Yes, we, we them were taken. My great aunt Bridget, who was my grandfather's sister, was married, was Countess of Ely, um, married to Joe Ely. And they had all these six children, the Ogilvies, who, who, which were wonderful. They were mostly uh, much older than me. But James, the youngest one, was my sister's age. And, and we went to live with them. And uh, Miss Bonner, I think... You know, I, I, I can only think she was slightly cracked in the head or something. I mean, whatever I did, however good, and I tried desperately hard to be good, you know, um, uh, I was punished every night. She would tie me up with my hands above my head. Um, and even now, sometimes I wake up with my arms, my hands above my head. Uh, and it didn't matter what I'd done, you know. And I was so confused because I felt my mother had engaged her and my mother must know somehow what she's doing to me. Mm. And was she just as cruel to Carrie? Or no, she, picked she wasn't. On you? Uh, mm. But it was perhaps even worse for Carrie because she witnessed this happening to me every night. Mm. And she got these very strange, very high temperatures. And I remember her, uh, that nobody knew why she wasn't well. And I remember she went to a clinic. My, my uh, great aunt was a Christian scientist. So, you know, she, uh, but, but I think before my mother left, she said to Aunt Bridget, look, if the children are ill, you've got to call it a doctor because they're, they're not Christian scientists mm. uh, and um, but then very luckily after about a year of this I, and that's why um, I used to I, I still do I love trees because that was the only way I could escape I used to climb a tree and for half an hour I knew I was so safe because I knew Miss Bonner couldn't climb up mm. after me and I used to hug the tree you know and it was my moment of uh, you know peace and safety um, uh, as I've always had this great sort of relationship, funny relationships with trees. Really. Um, does Miss Bonner still haunt you? Do you find that you still think about her? Uh, if you put well, it in I the past? Well, the most marvellous thing happened because at age 87, I was asked to write a book and I wrote um, Lady Waiting, who was success. And then they said, well, we'd like you to write two novels. So I thought, well, I'm not a, really a writer because I can only write, I can't make up things too much. You know, I, I write about people I know. And having written uh, Murder of Musty, which is great fun, um, I mean, all the people are sort of real. Mick Jagger said to me the other day, he said, in your book, Anne, you've got a musician awfully like me. I said, no, 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 Mick, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so interested, you think. It, it, of course, it's, it was him. Of course. <laughs> uh, and then I thought, well, I'm going to write a book about um, a, a sort of thrill about Holcomb, where we have a real um, uh, ghost, Lady Mary, Lady Mary Campbell, the daughter of the uh, Duke and Duchess of Argyle, who married Lord Cook, refused to consummate the marriage and was locked up at Holcomb, eventually rescued by her mother. But she haunts Holcomb. And so I Did thought, you see her? Uh, I, I, yes, a lot of people have seen her. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my sister. Uh, her, I felt her. She's a pusher and a pincher. <laughs> uh, 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 yes, I mean, uh, anyway, so I had great fun writing this book. And then I thought, well, I'm going to write it. I write it in my own name, actually. It's my childhood, really, haunting at Holcomb. Um, and so there I had Miss Bonner in my book, and I could do exactly what I liked to her. <laughs> and what I liked, I'm not going to give it away in case anybody hasn't read it, but she has a very, very uh, uncomfortable, horrible end. <laughs> and having written that, I felt released. It was most extraordinary. I just felt like, uh, I've seen her, I've done her, she's dead now. I, 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 it's very strange that, but that's what happened. And you were saved by another nanny, weren't you? Oh, well, then darling Miss William, uh, who had been a nanny to the Duke of um, Wellington's children, uh, was quite old, uh, not very uh, good-looking. She's very small with a gammy leg and a dripping nose. 
Anyway, when she arrived, she completely changed uh, Carrie's and my life. And I think that uh, Aunt Bridget, uh, the reason Miss Bonner was sacked, actually, but Aunt Bridget was a Christian scientist. Then they, they have a sort of thing about Roman Catholics. Miss Bonner was a Roman Catholic, and she's caught taking me to Mass and also teaching me the Lord's Prayer in French. I can't think why that was considered a sacrable <laughs> offence, but it was. And uh, I think Lizzie, James is now near, had realised, you know, what was happening. She's been and thank God she was sacked. And along came darling Billy Williams, and um, she was wonderful to me and used to take me on little trips. She said, no, the other two are too young. Well, I'll go exploring. And uh, she took me out and we sort of, she, she was a great botanist. And uh, we used to collect flowers and we used to, you know. Go. And then when we moved, when my parents came back, we, uh, my father was based in Cheshire. And the house we were in, when I looked out of the window, there was a little sort of courtyard. And having read The Secret Garden, which is one of my favourite books, um, Billy said, look, that's going to be our secret garden. We're not going to tell Carrie. And it just, she sort of rehabilitated me. She just suddenly me made me feel that life in future was going to be all right. And how long were you apart from your parents? Um, three years. And I remember when they came back, uh, so far we hid behind Billy. I remember. <laughs> We were, we were in the hall, and Aunt Bridget said, oh, your parents, I could see the car coming up. You know. And, so and Carrie and I sort of somewhere. shot behind Billy mm. and peered out behind her, you know. Uh, and, of course, we sort of recognised, because we had photographs of them, but physically and sort mm. of, you know, uh, they were complete strangers. And, what, and had they changed at all? I mean, did your father well, change? Well, well, I couldn't. You know, after three years, you can't really remember what people were like. In a way. Uh, my mother was wonderful. Within a few days, we were absolutely back with her. My father, it took longer. My father was also more reserved and um, never really kissed or hugged as much. Uh, and it rather like, I remember that photograph of the Queen at one point shaking Prince Charles's hand when he was three or something, when she came back from a long trip abroad. And that's what my father did. I, I, th I think he thought, well, maybe he was right. He didn't perhaps want to bend down because he had a moustache. He might, I, I, you know, I think he thought he might prickle us or something. Okay. But I remember shaking his hand, you know. And what do you, effect do you think it had on you being separated from them for so long? Well, I think looking back uh, was that I had to grow up very quickly. Mm. I had to cope with things that children shouldn't have to cope with and I'm afraid a lot of children do and the other thing is uh, when you're a child you don't say anything you, you you think that if you say anything people won't a, believe you and the person um, mistreating you will think up something even worse you know and punish you so you don't tell anybody um, and I think that nowadays children are encouraged much more to speak and also the grown-ups, I think, are more aware and they look out for abuse. Uh, but in those days, people were, I I'm sure, weren't aware at all of what she was doing to me. Did your mother ever know? Did you tell her? Well, this is the thing I did say to her years after. Uh, um, yes, years after, because she never said anything, and I never, I never said anything to her. And, and I did one day. I think we were in the Caribbean, and we each had a rather strong rum punch. You know, that gives you a little touch courage. <laughs> and I said to Mum, "You know, did you realise what she'd done like that?" And she didn't really want to, or she said to me, darling, things happened in the war. And in a way, afterwards, I felt that that was part of the war, that the children had to suffer that. You know, husbands and, uh, and cousins and men were killed, and children maybe suffered in a different way. Mm. And then at 16, you were sent to Powderham Castle, where Lady Devon ran a finishing school, <laughs> which girls with good marital prospects were taught how to run large country houses. What was that like? Well, it was quite interesting because there was no money. You couldn't go abroad uh, then, so you had to go. And in a way, it was uh, rather uh, very, very cunning of Lord and Lady Devon because they had, <laughs> they had 26 of us. And we completely ran that house. Well, we had a, a fortnight with a nanny where, where we did little Lord's 
so and so nappies, and uh, and I bet nobody knows, or very few people that I'm speaking to now will know what a gophering iron is, because a gophering iron was, was something because all little boys had frilly collars, uh, organs are frilly collars, and with a gophering iron you managed to sort of make it stand up and frilly. So the, I remember spending hours with this horrible thing. It's rather like what people do their hair with nowadays, twirl their hair. And then we had, which we loved, a fortnight with the butler. That was our great treat. Uh, and, and a scullery made to the cook. So we learnt exactly how a big house was run. And Lord Devon taught us heraldry, I think. And Lady Devon, f- f- rather funnily, taught us um, how to mend fuses. Because uh, <laughs> Lady Devon took the role much more of a man. She was much older than her husband, rather small little husband. Anyway, um, we, we uh, I really enjoyed that. And, uh, we, we had, I mean, not. I went with a wonderful friend called Mary Burbick, who really only preferred animals to people. And um, so she mucked out. I had a horse. I, they had stables there. So we each had a sort of horse. We had to muck out. She mucked out my horse. And I did her sewing because she said she couldn't do sewing. So I used to do her mending because we had to, uh, in those days, of course, all our clothes are mended. I mean, nowadays people just throw everything away. Uh, but then we had to mend holes in socks, you know. Uh, every, everything had to be mended. Anyway, having having left that, having left Powdrum, where I did learn, actually, about how to run a house, you know, uh, and how to do hospital corners on beds and how to clean properly, you know, and how to... Polish silver, because in those days you polished silver with your thumb. You had a sort of red paste, and then you polished, and it was quite agony on the thumb, but the silver was looked marvellous, actually, afterwards. Mm. Uh, I tried to teach the butlers we had later, where Colin and I were married, we were absolutely horrified. <laughs> <laughs> they were a certain, uh, my lady, I'm not going to polish the silver with my thumb. <laughs> so I said, well, I did when I was a child, or when I was young. And then I moved on where somewhere where I learnt more, I suppose, than I'd ever learnt during my whole scholastic career. And it was somewhere called the House of Citizenship. And it's run by a wonderful lady called Miss Neville Rofe, and her great-great-grandmother was Pocahontas, because her grandfather had gone to America and married Pocahontas, who then Queen Victoria... Uh, had heard about her and said, oh, I want to meet her. So poor Pocahontas was brought back to London. She didn't last long because of the fog and, the, and the, you know, she was used to living in... in. Uh, anyway, so, but Miss Neville Rowe uh, taught us citizenship, which meant that we went round uh, the country seeing how the country was run. Having learned how a stately home should be run, I then went round learning how the country was run. We went to uh, every sort of thing, law courts, hospitals, factories, um, the British Library, every sort of thing like that. Uh, and then we had the alternative of learning about art or typing. Well, I, mum said, <laughs> my mother said, look, and I think typing would be useful. Absolutely hopeless because he used to type along to music, uh, and of course I was never I was it's all, I was always out of sync. In the end, I gave it up and said um, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do the art course instead. <laughs> but one of the things I was taught was public speaking, and uh, we were used to be sitting there. And Miss Neville Rove said I was called Anne Cook in those days. That was my, and uh, she said Anne Cook, um, five minutes on the Firth of Forth Bridge. And you you didn't know what it was. It could be anything. Up you got, you thought on your feet, and you talked. And um, that's actually because of my new career. Um, It's been invaluable. And did you do any O-levels or A-levels or exams at all? No, we did did O-level. I got a distinction in everyone, which very much surprised me and my parents. And then you were named debutante of the year in 1950. And there was still clothes rattling. So at your coming out dance, you wore a pale green dress made from a parachute. What was that like? Yes, I'm rather simply thrilled because there were still coupons. And the only thing we had uh, at Hoka was a a lot of wonderful champagne. (laughs) Because in spite of being a girl, um, uh, my great-grandfather did lay down champagne for my coming out. Um, I thought it probably would have been better champagne if I'd been a boy, but anyway, (laughs) we were all thrilled. And I had this marvellous dance, and the king and queen came. It was white tie, medals, Princess Margaret came. And we still had, um, since of all, uh, 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 um, the people who lit up. There was a a sort of battery, because when the... um, 
German airplanes came across, uh, they lit them up in the sky so they could be shot down, hopefully. Anyway, they were still in the park. And they said to my, my father, um, would you like us to light the park up? for your daughter's coming out. They were just about to go, but, but we can stay on for a few days. And that's what happened. The whole park was lit up with coloured lights right up, and the long, long avenue uh, at Holcomb was lit up. And my father went up to the top, to the Golden Gate, to meet the king and queen as they arrived right at the... And the, 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 the um, drive is nearly two miles long. And so they drove down, you know, and it was, all, I mean, it was wonderful. The fountain was on. We had Tommy Kinsman, which was the, the sort of debutante band, which luckily the queen mother absolutely adored. And when she arrived, I remember her saying to my mother, do you think it would be possible if I could ask for some tunes? Because generally when Tommy's here, um, I'm allowed to ask for some tunes that I like. So my mother said, of course, ma'am, absolutely. <laughs> and the Queen Mother, and they have marvellous crinoline, you know, and the jewels, and she was always sparkly. I remember her, you know, going up, and, and, and Tommy Kinsman, they all did a deep bow, you know, and then she asked for her tunes, and she danced all night, you know. And is it uh, true that the cooks at Hokum gathered up the shed velvet from deer's antlers and fried it and served it on toast? Yeah, well, that's a great thing. My great-grandfather had anything that, that, that was on the estate or the beach. Uh, we used to, uh, he used to eat those razor shells, which were just like rubber, <laughs> absolutely uneatable. Delicious, he said. And, of course, the, the eel, a lovely story about, because the Prince Charles used to come to Holcombe uh, a great deal um, when he was small because um, the Queen had never been to boarding school and when he had mumps or measles or something like that he always came to Holcombe because my mother was a lady in waiting and he absolutely adored it and one of the things he did was my father used to take him on the lake to, to, to catch eels there used to be floats that were green and then when, you, when there was an eel on the end it turned over and was red and uh, I saw King Charles now uh, the other day, actually, and I, I was talking to him about his time at Holcomb, and I said, I remember you catching eels, and he said, yes, that was fun, he said, but the worst po moment was when my, your father said to me, and now we're going to cook them, <laughs> and they went down to the kitchen, and I, I don't know whether you ever cut up an eel, but they, the, the bits don't die, I mean, they're, 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 and the bits also, I, I tried to put them in the pan, and they just leapt out, he said, I, 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 he said, I knew I had to. I mean, if your father said they were delicious and I had to eat them. So in the end, I think he said I did have a small part. But he said, I, he said I'd never forget that, uh, putting the bits of eels in the pan and they just leapt out again. <laughs> Maybe that's where he got his love of nature and the environment. Well, I think so. I mean, he lo really loved coming and, and um, you know, he's a great personal friend. And then, extraordinarily, they let you become a travelling saleswoman in America. Um, yes, uh, which I absolutely loved. I, I did it all around England. And, of course, I was the only woman on the... I used to stay, hopefully, with friends if it was somewhere where I knew someone, uh, but mostly in hotels. And you were selling your mother's pottery, weren't you? Yes. And my mother sent me your house barely 17. Um, but I loved that because I was on my own. I loved driving. I, I loved... I realised I liked selling you know, at an early age. And then she sent me to America um, where I was with a friend, actually, when I got the te this telegram. And I was um, terrified, uh, you know, because telegrams were only sent when somebody died. And I opened it, and they had said, and come home, you've been asked to be a maid of honour at the coronation. So what was that like? You and the other young women well, were sort of like it, a girl it was, band. It was right? extraordinary. It was wonderful. I mean, I, we came back, we had lots of rehearsals with the Duchess of Norfolk. The Duke of Norfolk um, did the... Uh, people say, oh, he did the most amazing job. and all that sort of thing. Some of them forget that he'd done the late King's coronation. So he'd done it once at a very young age, quite young. And so I think to, for him, you know, uh, it hadn't been all that long time ago, just before the war. And he was magnificent, the Duke of uh, uh, Norfolk. Uh, he organised it all. He trained us all. Uh, we knew exactly what to do. We had one rehearsal with the Queen at Buckingham Palace where she wore a sort of curtain round her middle. <laughs> and, we, and we sort of trailed up and down after her. And then she did turn at the end. She said, because uh, we were looking a bit worried, you know, because the Duchess of Norfolk had been absolutely, 
correct, and there was the Queen. So we thought not perhaps taking enough attention. And then she just turned to us at the end and said, don't worry, girls, I'll look all right on the day. <laughs> so we were great to leave. And she, of course, she did. I mean, we were the first people to see her dress, really. Uh, and four of us were waiting at the... Um, Abbey door, and we could hear her coming, and we could hear the roar. And round the corner came this golden coach, and it stopped in front of us. Two of the pages opened the door, and there she was. And, we, and so we got her out of the coach. She, she didn't say anything to us at that point. We got her all ready. There she was with her back to us, um, and the, uh, the train was rippling over our hands. And then she just turned round and she said, Ready, girls? And off we went. <laughs> Listening to Past and Perfect in association with the Youth Social Mobility Charity Speakers for Schools, with Alice Thompson, Rachel Sylvester, and our guest this week, Lady Glen Connor. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to Past and Perfect in association with Speakers for Schools, with Alice Thompson, Rachel Sylvester, and our guest, Lady Glen Connor. I mean, I can go on forever about Coronation. <laughs> anyway, the Queen said the one moment when the cameras are to be turned off is during the anointing, because it's a very religious moment. And so that's what they did. They turned the cameras off, they put a canopy over her, and we were standing just there so we could see her and one, some of the bishops. And it was um, absolutely amazing. They took all the regalia off her, and the Dowager Duchess of Devonshire, and a wonderful gentleman called uh, the Marquess of China, their role was to dress her in this very, very um, uh, little uh, linen dress, actually, white linen dress. Well, during the rehearsals, when it was actually uh, the Duchess of Norfolk, the Marquis of Chumley could not do up the hooks and eyes at the back of the dress. I mean, he never dressed himself, let alone anybody <laughs> else. I mean, it, absolutely hopeless. And the Duke of Norfolk got more and more irritated with him and said, well, look, I can see you absolutely can't do this. Uh, well, put on press studs. And so all you've got to do is press. Well, that's what happened. And, of course, there he was, pressing <laughs> into the Queen's back, and the Queen was going back and forth. And <laughs> I, afterwards, I said to her, ma'am, well, was that OK? And she said, he was not all right, her. And she said, I don't know what the Marquis of Tumley thought he was doing, <laughs> but he dug his fist in. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, quite a funny bit. But, but then, of course, it was uh, very, very moving, and she gave her whole life, you know, to, the, uh, to Great Britain and the Commonwealth. And then uh, they gave her back all her regalia, and then we went behind the rude screen, and I'd felt rather faint during the service. And luckily, I was... At the back, uh, there was another um, maid of honor in front of me, and beside me was Black Rod, a wonderful gentleman dressed in uh, black velvet and satin with a sort of billiard cue he's holding. I don't know what it represented. Uh, definitely not a billiard cue, but I never found out, actually. And he saw me swaying slightly, and so he moved in beside me, and he put his hand uh, around my middle like that and pinned me to the stone pillar at the back, just giving me time to recover, which I did. And so when I got behind the, ru the rude screen, the Archbishop of Canterbury produced a bottle of brandy from somewhere out of his robes, and he, he did offer it to the Queen, who naturally said no. <laughs> uh, and then he did turn to me, he said, Anne, I think maybe, because uh, I, I think they what seen my you know, swaying and green face, I think a little little drop might be. So I had a lovely glug, which made all the difference. <laughs> I then came back, you know, off we sat down the abbey, and it was, it was magnificent. And are you looking forward to the King's coronation? Do you think it's going to be very different, more scale? Well, I do. I mean, I, I've just read it in the newspapers. I, I know him quite well over the years, you know, having known him since he was about four. Um, I think it will. It won't be... I, I, in my opinion, there will only ever be one coronation like the Queen. Uh, I, I doubt there will ever be another because you've got Prince William, you've got Prince George, you, you've got men in the future who are going to be king. And um, 
I mean, Queen Victoria was crying when she was very young, but you couldn't really call Queen Victoria very beautiful. I mean, and the Queen was so beautiful. And the other thing was that we'd all lived through the war in different ways. We'd all had a pretty awful time. And there, suddenly, we had something to rejoice in, a new Elizabethan age um, and a new beautiful queen. I mean, she was ravishing, you know. And when we came out, one of the, I suppose, other wonderful things that we did, was everywhere the queen went, we had to go. And so out on the balcony we came, and the roar, the crowds, you couldn't put a pin between them, all roaring and loving, you could feel the love for her. And there, every time she turned to go in, you know, they wouldn't let her. They, they were... And then that evening, I went back with a friend. I knew she was coming out after dinner, um, not in her robes, in her evening dress. And so I went back with a friend and cheered and waved at her up there on the balcony. And I thought, early in the day, I was up there with her, <laughs> and now I'm roaring for her. You know? And you must have been overwhelmed by attention. But your mother's only advice about sex was re- always to refer to her favourite dog, wasn't it? Oh, we're, we're, we're down to sex now. <laughs> yes, I'm sure we are. <laughs> I wondered when you were going to get onto that. Well, <laughs> I know. Um, well, yes, because no, n- nothing was ever said. I, I, and it was when I was in the taxi going to the station to meet, um, I gained my train to my new school, uh, um, she th- thought it was a good idea, I suppose, to tell me something, because I was 11. In fact, I did get my period when I, uh, when I was 11. And, uh, and then s- the sex bit, she, s- she said, then said, I think I better, perhaps, as I've t- told you about your period, I better tell you a bit more. So my heart sank. I thought, what is she going <laughs> to tell me? And she said, well, the thing is, darling, that when you get married, um, you, you know what Daddy's Labrador tries to get on top of biscuits with. Um, uh, well, well, the same will happen to you. And I thought, well, <laughs> Daddy's Labrador getting... I, I mean, has my mother gone completely mad? <laughs> uh, and I said, what, Daddy's Labrador? No, no, darling, when you get married, I mean, you get married to a man, she said. <laughs> you know, and, and I was so frightfully stupid. Um, and that was it. Um, and that was probably the reason, partly, that uh, in those days when I, uh, I did grow up uh, and I was young, we didn't sleep with people because there was no uh, real proper contraception. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, all our mothers gave us absolute thing. You know, you jolly well uh, you know, behave and you don't do this. And, you know, because if you get pregnant, that's it. Mm. That's your life over. Uh, and, you you know, banished to Alaska or something. Uh, and, and so um, we didn't. I mean, it was what I call quite heavy petting went on. But, but, but we never uh, slept with somebody. And looking back on it, I think that was quite difficult, especially in my... Uh, a case with Colin, you know, who was very impatient and not, um, you know. So you first of all fell for Princess Diana's father, Johnny Oldthorpe, didn't you? What, uh, yeah, what yes. went wrong there? Well, that, that well, I'll tell you about that. And Jack Spencer said, you can't marry Anne. Anne's got mad blood in her or something. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, that was it. Oh, I see. But so he, he was banned it, from marrying you. Yes, uh, and Johnny was not, never... It was brave enough to tell me. And then on the rebound, you fell for Lord um, Glen Connor's son and heir, Colin Tennant. What was he like the first time you met well, him? Well, um, the thing was that I was used to all my, what my, who my father chose as people that he sort of thought I might marry. They were sort of hunting, shooting with sort of dripping castles in Scotland and dank rhododendron gardens. And <laughs> I, I suddenly, actually, it was at the Ritz. I was at a... Um, uh, coming out dance or a dance of somebody and I was standing uh, with I can't remember who it was by the bar waiting for a drink and Colin and his stepmother were just next door I, I didn't know either of them the person I was with knew Colin's stepmother and uh, so that's how we were introduced and uh, of course I've never met anybody like Colin before I mean he's exciting he was charismatic he was amazing and uh, funny and full of fizzing with ideas and um, it was lovely. I mean, he, he, I absolutely loved him. And um, I, of course, my father didn't. Uh, I, I mean, my father was <laughs> horrified. My, my mother liked him, but, but she had witnessed some of his sort of difficult behaviour. 
and uh, she did warn me and everything. And of course, I witnessed some of it myself. But of course, being in love, and Colin said, well, darling, Anne, the minute we're married, I'm never going to lose my temper again. It's famous last words, because he lost it on our honeymoon. So what happened? When did you realise things were taking a slightly dark turn? Well, um, I mean, our honeymoon wasn't very easy. I mean, we arrived very late in Paris and um, staying at the Lottie Hotel, went up to our sort of bridal suite and there were two single beds. Well, Colin completely lost it, raced downstairs with this sort of pathetic little man behind the, 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 the desk and said, I don't know. And the man said, well, the only thing I can suggest is, is a double mattress in the basement, if you help me. We, we'll take it up. This is three o'clock, or nearly three o'clock in the morning. Well, by the time they got it up, everybody had come out of their rooms. It had woken the whole hotel, all looking. They then eventually arrived in our bedroom. They flung this uh, mattress over the bed. The little man saw half underneath it, managed to get out. <laughs> Colin flung himself on top and went to sleep. And that, and that, that was, I mean, you know, I'm a romantic, uh, in spite of what my mother said. I was thinking it might be quite romantic. Well, of course, it, it improved slightly. But, th- but then he took me, you know, uh, he said he'd got a surprise for me. And I thought, you know, dinner at the Ritz. Got on my best dress. I remember standing there in we got to the taxi. And I did think it was a bit odd the way we were going, as I could see the Ritz disappearing out of the back window. And I kept on saying, where are we going? Oh, it's a surprise. And it's something I'm sure you'll absolutely love. We arrived at this scene. It was a brothel. I went up to this bedroom and there were two wing back chairs which we both sat in. I sat as far back as I could because in front of us on the double bed were two of the most unattractive French people making love. Horrible noise they were making. And they kept on saying the squ- squelching noise they made, oh. which, funnily enough, because of saying squelching, I don't know why. I have a very, very odd time now because quite often at parties, I mean, I don't like over there, pe- men, I don't know, all they, ca- they come up to me and they said, Lady Gin Connor, squelch. <laughs> and I never know. Well, luckily I'm 90, so I pretend I haven't heard, but that's a mistake because if I say excuse me, they then say it louder. So I then, uh, actually, I, I just winkle off as quickly as I can oh. and try not. But anyway, that, that's an aside. But um, So uh, what did he think he was doing? No, and of course they said, because they, uh, would you like to join in? And I'm being very, very polite. And I said, it's frightfully, with my eyes shut, it's frightfully kind of you, but no thank you. <laughs> and, and thank God, eventually, they, they left. And I did say to Colin, but why? Uh, and it, he just said, I thought it would excite you. And I thought, no, oh, no. So and said, then well, you had an extraordinary incident, incident, didn't you, with a donkey. That was the one that everyone couldn't quite get over. The extraordinary oh, yeah. one well, that then, no one well, could Well, then believe. he took me back. Uh, I, I, I sort of thought, well, so after the um, uh, session in the brothel, I thought I'm never going to Paris again. Uh, and then, anyway, Colin persuaded me, he wanted to buy me something, and he said, come on, you know. And then he said, we're going to the theatre. And I thought, I don't know, some sort of Shakespeare. And thing. We went to this ghastly place, which was again uh, uh, this man making love to... And there were other things too, which I won't go into. But uh, I said, well, that's that. Uh, I, Who was I, it, did I, you say? It I, was well, a... I have been back to Paris with somebody, with, with, a, with another friend of mine. Did you say it was a man with a donkey? Yes. Oh, my goodness. And what was the worst thing that Colin never did to you? Because he could be incredibly kind and charismatic, but he could also be very cruel, couldn't he? Well, I, in my new book, Whatever Next, um, when I wrote um, Lady in Waiting, I sort of hinted at it. And because I got... Uh, one of the marvellous things, really, about uh, my book were, was the reaction and the letters, because it's been translated, I think, into about 12 different languages, uh, uh, from all over the world. Uh, uh, you know, some about... A lot of gay people wrote to me because of writing about my darling Henry having AIDS and uh, the way Henry told me he was gay and all that. Uh, and then... Um, uh, 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 and people have been abused, too. Um, and, you, you know, I, I was amazed by the sort of interest in my life, actually. And that's why I thought, well, um, you know, my, my publishers were very keen, too, uh, that I should write something else. And it, it, I thought, this time, I'm 90, I asked the children, I had a long talk with the children, um, 
that I am going to write about the abuse I suffered most of my married life. And the interesting thing was that um, when I was talking to the children, a lot of stories, they didn't know the full extent of what I'd been through. And I didn't know the full extent of what they had been through. And I, I, it was really sad. But uh, And anyway, all these stories came out. And by the end of it, we've talked about it rather like, you know, killing off Miss Bonner in Haunting at Holcomb. It, it, it's all come out. We all feel so much better for it and so much better. It's taken a long time. Mm. I only wish I'd been able to do it before, you know. But he was quite violent to you, wasn't he? Well, this time in particular, it was a girl's birthday. We're having a, a birthday t a tea or late tea, I think it was, at Basel Spa, one or two other children. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and um, he had some clients with him. I mean, he came over to the birthday, and they went back. Then he said, Anne, will you, will you come and meet them, you know? Uh, which I did, but, but I then said, look, I you know, want to go back to the girls. I went back, and suddenly there was Colin. I could see these white, and he just got hold of my arm. He said, come with me. And afterwards, I, 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 I was telling May, uh, I was talking to my daughter, May, and, she, and I said, do you remember, Dad? She said, yes, I do. I think they were about seven or something. And she said, I said to Barbara, our nanny, is Mummy all right? What's Daddy going to do to her? Uh, and Barbara said, oh, no, no, don't worry about Mummy. She'll be OK. But uh, May said she was worried about me. Um, and anyway, Connie took this, this was so it's premeditated. Took me into the car. It, it took about te uh, ten minutes to drive up to our house. He didn't speak to me at all. He got out, and he always had this shark's bone walking stick. And he suddenly, uh, as I turned, he hit me at the back of the head, uh, and, and then I fell, and he hit and hit and hit me. Oh. Uh, and then, um, uh, especially this year, I can't. It's I can't hear anything. In my left ear. And uh, I then crawled into my bedroom. I remember being able to put put the chair at the door. And all night, I was far too frightened to come out of the room because um, I thought he might be out there. Uh, and my, my bedroom was on the ground floor in the main house. And Barbara and the girls were in sort of chalets in the garden. And in the morning, I, craw I got the window open and I got out of the window because I thought he might still be. I crawled up to her chalet and said, Barbara, I think I need a doctor. And uh, which she got, you know, and she's wonderful, Barbara. Um, I covered in blood and bruises and all that. I thought he was going to kill me. And um, anyway, the doctor came. He didn't ask me, he knew. I mean, the doctor knew. The trouble was in Mustique that Colin owned the island, he employed everybody on the island. And that was what was so difficult. Um, because in a way, the West Indies was the worst possible place for Colin to be, because he was incredibly generous, incredibly thought, you know, uh, would do anything for anybody in the village. But but he was a bit violent, and they took it, and nothing was said. I mean, we had our own policeman, but he's employed by Colin. Mm. So, Did you confront him at all? Well, yes. I mean, I, I I wouldn't see him. I mean, Barbara was wonderful. I could hear her giving him absolute, uh, and he took it from Barbara. I mean, Barbara was a, a sort of nanny, he was like a small boy, uh, and he brought a little bunch of flowers, I remember seeing them. And I had to be there for about a week, because I didn't want the children to see me, you know, uh, with a brew. And then I did come out. Um, and the other thing, talking about men, was that he, after beating me nearly to death, he then went back to Basel Spa, and I'm not going to say who it was, but he talked to somebody, uh, uh, you know, that we all knew who he employed and everything like that, and said, I've just given Anne a thrashing. And this man did nothing. I mean, he could have gone to Barbara and said, I think Lady Anne might need you. Anything. Yeah. Nothing. Absolute closed shop. Uh, and, and, well, men are like that. Mm. Uh, uh, they don't want to... I suppose he was frightened, Colin. I, I don't know what happened. Nothing. And then, yeah. when I eventually came out, a very well-known lady on the island came up to me and said, oh, have you been a naughty girl? And that was the moment. I don't know about, I always remember that. And I thought, how could somebody say mm. that? But that was the sort of attitude slightly, you know? So why didn't you divorce him? Why didn't you leave him? I didn't, because... I was brought up not to divorce. I brought up. I was brought up in the war. I think Miss Bonner 
ill-treating me. I got through a whole year of being tied up to the bed. I wasn't broken. Colin didn't break me, and I wasn't going to be broken by him. And I was going to try um, my mother. I did go home once, just after, um, just before Charlie was born, and say to my mother, I don't know whether I can take it. I don't know if I can cope with him, you know. And she said, you've married him. You go straight back and make the best of it. And I did. And you work with victims of domestic y- abuse. Yes, Do you I, think that well, was partly because well, you identified? Well, I was married um, through somebody called David Astor, who um, was a great friend of Erin Pitsy. Um, and she was the first person to um, organise safe places for women who were being abused. And there was a free telephone number, and they could ring the telephone number, and somebody would collect them from the telephone box. And, you know, there they were, these beaten-up wives, with maybe two or three children in their nighties, clutching teddies. I mean, it was so sad. Mm -hmm. But at least we gave them and then we were they were put into flats two or three families together so that uh, you know there's something to talk to and, and one of them or two of them would go out to work while one looked after the children we tried to recreate a sort of family life for them because that was what's so important because some of them went back we rescued them and they went back partly that they missed this terrifying excitement this terrifying thing of not knowing what was going to happen and if you could break that if you could give them something uh, else um, which we tried to do um, then you know there was much more chance of them having you know leaving the husband and do you think you identified with them did you wish somebody had done that for you and helped you escape Yes, I mean, what we had were wonderful friends. I mean, I had wonderful friends. But but we tried always to make a joke of it. And that's what I did in my first book. You, you try and make excuses. And you try and see the funny side. You try anything not to think about the really dark side. And because... Um, not that I think any of my friends, they had different troubles. I had one great, great friend whose husband w- w- was a gamble, gambler and gambled everything away. He had huge estates, gambled everything away. I mean, that was awful. That's abuse I- in a different way, I think. Um, but, um, it, it, the, you know, we, we had friends. And then, of course, I wouldn't in any way encourage anybody to stay in a sort of marriage like mine but I was very fortunate really in the end because Colin went out to the West Indies he spent a lot of time out there we weren't together the whole time Uh, my father uh, at that point I had my house in Norfolk um, and I did always we we telephoned each other every other day we talked he came back I and I nursed him he had cancer right there and then I went nursed him and that was what the most um something that I cling on to and then he said to me and it wasn't all bad and I said no Colin it wasn't all bad when you think about your life do you think that suffering has made you more resilient in a way well I think that the way I was brought up my mother um my faith you know um And it's perhaps just in me a bit, you know. I think when you've been through the fiery furnace, like losing my darling boys and Christopher having his accident, you know, I nursed him. He was in a coma for uh, over four months and I wasn't going to lose him. I knew the boys were dying, Henry of AIDS, Charlie of drug-related things, and it all happened in the same time. And I, um, luckily, I have a faith Um, And I used it. I prayed a lot. I had very stern talks with God. I said, I know you're taking two of my sons. You're not taking Christopher. Mm -hmm. And I nursed Christopher. Um, uh, Luckily, my nanny Barbara, who went on to look after Prince William and Harry, she'd just left that job and rang me up and said, Lady Anne, I'd love to give you a year helping you look after Christopher. And uh, we did, and we did interesting things um, with him. That, uh, uh, that, in fact, Barbara and I wrote a um, uh, a essay for the Lancet about how, as lay people, we thought you should treat people in comas. We nursed him on the floor so that I could sit behind him, and he lay on my so he could feel my heart. 
Um, he couldn't swallow. And the doctor said there's no um, hope, really. I mean, if he can't swallow, he'll be in a vegetative state. And one day, Barbara brought a baby's bottle to the hospital. And the nurse said, what are you doing, Miss Barnes, with the bottle? And she said, well, Christopher was her first baby. Barbara never looked after a baby, and Christopher was her first. And she said, can I just try it? Because Christopher's very greedy little baby. And she put the tea between his lips and so squeezed it and he started to suck and he swallowed uh, and all that and then we also with an, another doctor who I met um, who told me about this sort of coma kit uh, um, that he tried on his own son who'd had an accident and it's stimulating the five senses but you have to do it quarter of an hour in every hour and because of all my friends we had a wonderful um, uh, thing on and and they all used to help me and it was absolutely it was extraordinary and that's what gave me such joy and spirit was all these friends coming to help me when I needed them and of course I've also been able to help other friends a great friend of mine his daughter died of a, a drug overdose um, and uh, I think when you have friends like that it gives you so much energy um, I w looked after. Um, Christopher for five years before he was able to, um, you know, uh, live on his own. And when I got him back home, it was tough love because the, 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 the council, they all came, you know, around, do you want this put in? Do you want lift and a hoist and a thing? I said, no, I want absolutely nothing. Christopher is going to get well and he's going to do it under his own steam with me. And that was it. And he went up, I mean, looking back, I don't think, I don't know how I did it, but he, he went up and downstairs on his bottom for ages because he couldn't think. And um, he did it. Mm -hmm. He's been married twice. His, his first, my first wife, he's had two lovely daughters uh, and they both got firsts at King. <laughs> and, the, and then he married lovely Joanna, who's now by PA and looks after me. And, you know, what a lovely end. What would you like to have said to your seven-year-old self when you were up in Scotland and you were having a really difficult time with your nanny? No, I would have said, stick it out and life is going to get better. Lady Gang Connor, thank you so much for joining us on Past Imperfect. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really great. Thank you. You've been listening to Past Imperfect in association with the youth social mobility charity Speakers for Schools with Alice Thompson, Rachel Sylvester and our guest this week, Lady Glen Connor. The producer was Lucy Ditchmont. If you've enjoyed this episode of Past Imperfect, please do go to the Times Radio app where you can download our interviews with guests including Keir Starmer, Ruth Davidson, Angela Rayner and Nadia Hussain. You can also buy a copy of our book, What I Wish I'd Known When I Was Young. Thank you for listening to Past Imperfect. If you've been affected by any of the issues raised in this episode or others in the series, please go to our podcast page or website, where there are links to charities and organisations who are there to help.